Thank you, Rachel. Well, as Rachel said, my name's Robin. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I would love to meet you. If you are new, I hang out in the atrium, usually after the gathering, and uh, just tap me on the shoulder, introduce yourself. If I met you last week, can you reintroduce yourself to me this week? <laughs> Maybe for the next few weeks until I can get your, I'll recognize your face. I can't promise I'll know your name. Uh, we are in the final week of this series, Experiencing Jesus, and it might be the last week of this series, but it's not the last face of Jesus or the last angle that we are going to see of Jesus. Week after week, regardless of the series we're in or the passage that we're unpacking, we are going to continue exploring the realities of Jesus. We're going to continue to be surprised by Jesus. In week one of this series, I shared a quote that I really liked by Adolf Hall. He said, we must be prepared to be always correcting our image of Jesus, for we will never exhaust what there is to know. Jesus is full of surprises. And Jesus, as we say over and over again, is the face of God, right? And so, and so, as we're always correcting our image of Jesus, we are correcting our image of God. When we see Jesus in a new light, we are seeing God in a new light. And you know, if you're raised in church, as I was, there may be a lot of unlearning to do about our images of God. If you are not raised in church and you've just seen the underbelly of the church on your media screens, uh, toxic theology, toxic masculinity, misogyny, racism, all of the isms coming out of the church, there may be some unlearning for you to do as you see more fully the face of Jesus, which is the face of God. Maybe your image of God will be corrected. For those wounded, wounded by the church, wounded, by religion. Not only will you need to experience healing, and I hope you're getting that healing, but hopefully there'll be some unlearning for you to do too. Correcting those toxic images or impressions that you naturally have of God. So whatever our image of Jesus is, that's our image of God, right? We see Jesus, we see God, and Jesus wants to continue to surprise us in the best sense of the word. If you're new or you're just tuning in after vacation, we have looked at Jesus as friend, which just seems kind of obvious, except in the Jewish thought of his day, friend was considered a second self. We use that word friend. We have friends on Facebook. We have friends on Instagram. We just have, we have intimate friends. We just have friends. We use the same word friend. In, the, in Jewish thought, a friend was a second soul. And in Greek philosophy, which was saturated into the first century culture of Israel, a friend was like one's own self. And so when Jesus picked up that word friend, he knew exactly what he was trying to communicate to those disciples. You are like my second soul, like my other self. And then we looked at Jesus as savior, and savior in the first century was not a religious word. It was a political word. And Jesus borrowed it right from the realm of politics and applied it to what he was trying to tell them. He was saying, don't trust in political power and personalities to save the world. It won't. They won't. Rather, I am the savior. My way is the way for the world to be saved. And Jesus as savior is more to do with healing this life than leaving it. And then we looked at Jesus' presence, and Johanna unpacked that beautifully. Honestly, if you haven't watched it, if you missed it, go back and watch it. It was just absolutely powerful. And she talked about Jesus being the presence of God with us, empowering us, in us. And I remember she stood here and she said, imagine the God of the universe in us. Like, that just takes a lot of pondering to really grasp that, if we ever could grasp that. And today we're looking at, the G at Jesus as the way. And this is one of those traditional, maybe I'll call it a blind spot, where the way has almost become more like an obstacle to God, a border checkpoint of orthodox beliefs, rather than an invitation. Come, walk my way. Come, I'll show you the way. 
And before we get to the passage that we're looking at today, I just want to set the context, the setting in which Jesus said this, or said what he's about to say. I remember going on our first vacation without the kids. Do you remember that? Or maybe you're just dreaming of that. It is burned in my memory. You see, the kids were older, one was in university, two were in high school, they had part-time jobs, and our family vacation, we just couldn't make the university and the high school schedules work. And so Steve and I were like, well, I guess we're gonna go on vacation by ourselves. And so, so, (laughs) so we were gonna head to Barbados on our own, and you know, without the kids. And I know it sounds idyllic, it does. And they were cool with it. Like, they were way too cool with it. They were excited about it, actually. The mom and dad are leaving, and they're staying home, and it just, you know, what? Anyway. And I was kind of excited about it until I started thinking, what if we don't come back? Like, the plane could go down. Hopefully after the vacation, not before, but... (laughs) Mark's killing himself laughing over here because he's the eternal optimist. I'm the worst case scenario person. Any other worst case scenario persons? Yes! You know, the world needs us. The world needs us. So I sat down and I wrote them each a letter. Now that was a really hard thing to do. I put in the letter where the will was. Good luck with that. Who they could count on if we didn't make it back. Congratulating them on the graduations that were yet to come the warm sentiments that I would have said at their weddings if I'd been there. All that mushy stuff and the important stuff like who gets my books, right? The stuff that I really wanted them to know, how much I loved them, how how much confidence I had in them. Stick together, kids, stick together. You've all you've got now is each other. The cautions that I wanted to leave them with I know you're thinking, you need therapy, girl. (laughs) I know, there's lots of things I need therapy for. But I'm in good company with this, just so you know. My emotionally charged state of leaving my kids, haunted by the thought that I might not come back, is very much the context of the passage that we're looking at today. You see, Jesus did the same thing. Granted, he knew he was dying, I just feared I would. But that's kind of the context, the setting that we're looking at today. He knew he was leaving them. And all evidence that we have suggests they were unprepared. They just weren't ready for this. They didn't expect it. He told them over and over and over and over again, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And they just, they just couldn't. They just couldn't grasp it. They couldn't get it out of their heads that Jesus wasn't coming back to take over the throne, to expel the Romans, to make Israel great again. They just couldn't compute because they didn't have a category for it. And I heard a great line this week that helps explain it. Their agenda made them ignorant. Their agenda made them ignorant. And I think it would be arrogant of us to fault them for their inability to hear what Jesus was trying to say because we have so many blind spots of our own. Places where our own agendas make us ignorant and unable to see and hear Jesus and the Jesus message. So they were terrified. They were terrified of being separated from Jesus and from each other, right? What is gonna happen to this little band of followers? They'd been together for three years. Imagine a group of people, imagine if you were there, being together for three years, eating together, traveling together, arguing together, resolving together the memories they shared, the shared experiences, the intimacy that they shared. What would happen to all of that without Jesus? They'd seen God do miraculous things through Jesus and from, through themselves. So what now? Would that continue? Would they still have access to God? They'd been following Jesus for three years with one outcome in mind, expecting one thing, and now he's leaving. Naturally, they're worried about the future. Now what? And so Jesus is explaining what is going to happen. These are his last words, you could say, to his kids. I'm looking at John 14, and we're starting at verse 1. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. 
He's trying to calm their anxiety, their worry. You believe in God? Believe also in me. And then he goes on into this explanation of where he's going and what he's gonna be up to and, and it's gonna make a great deep dive sermon one day, but we're not gonna cover that part of the passage. Um, there's so much reorienting to do there, so there's a teaser for another day. It goes on, he says, in my father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. And then the part that we're looking at today. And you know the way. He said, you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said, Lord, like, we don't. <laughs> we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way. Now what on earth could that mean, I am the way? Throughout scripture, all of their scriptures, there was a lot of way talk. Way in Jewish thinking, in Jewish thought, was the way you lived. It wasn't simply what you believed, it was the way you lived. There was the way of righteousness and wisdom, and there was the way of wickedness. And see, we see this contrasted all throughout scripture, but in one of their uh, revered prophets, he says this, Isaiah, let the wicked forsake their ways, doesn't say beliefs, he says their ways. My ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, God's ways are so much better. And these instructions, all these instructions kind of help keep you on the path, but they're not the path. Road signs aren't the way. <laughs> road signs, signs aren't the road. The path is the way. What you do, how you live, is the path. Do you see the contrast? Way of wickedness, way of doing life, versus way of God, a different way of doing life. And now Jesus is saying, I am the way. I'm not the road sign pointing to the way. I am, I am the way. Not the zillions of laws, not the sacrificial obligations of the temple, not the ritual requirements of religion, none of that, I am the way. And he just blew up their entire religious paradigm. He demolished their entire religious worldview. And I'm not, I'm not sure how to say it more forcefully than that. All the stuff they learned in Sunday school, it's been upended. Everything they understood about God, the way to God, how to know God, who gets to God, is being upended. Jesus surprised them once again. And I think the impact is kind of lost on us. See, remember for them, the temple, the sacrifices, the priests, that's what gave them access to God. Within the walls of the temple, God was found. Through priests, God was encountered. The temple was central. It was essential to their relationship to God, to their experience of God. It's like if, if you could only experience God, you could only have access to God, you could only get the forgiveness of God if you came in to Lakeside, the building. It's kind of like that. Jesus was blowing all that up. He's saying, I am the way, not the temple, not the priest, not the sacrificial system, not even your scriptures. I am the way. And if that wasn't enough, he presses in further. In John 15 we read, which is all part of the same letter that he's writing to his kids, right? It's all part of this same goodbye, farewell thing. He says, abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He's saying, dwell in me and I will dwell in you. Jesus in us. Jesus' presence, God's presence, dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. No longer is access to God restricted within the walls of a temple or an institution. It's or mediated by special people or necessitated by ritual. That's what he's saying without saying it. There's the temple way and there's me. I replace the temple. And that's the contrast he's making here. The religious system versus Jesus. The temple versus Jesus. Abiding versus just believing. 
Believing is something we do with our head. Abiding is something we do with our whole person, our whole body. And from now on, God through the Holy Spirit is gonna dwell in his people individually but also collectively. We're kind of like these movable temples going throughout the world, mediating God's presence, hope, joy, love. Isn't that neat? He's showing the world a better way, God's way, life as God intends it, striving for equity and justice and equality and mercy. Look at these people. It's like, look at these people, these little temples. See how they live? That's my way. That's a lot to live up to, isn't it? Christianity at its core, in its essence, is not a set of beliefs about God. It's a good starting place, but it's a way of life the way of God. And that way, that way is love. But for Jesus, love isn't a noun, it's a verb. And for sure, we do use it as a verb. We say, I love you, the verb. But often when we say that, we sort of mean, I have love for you. I have admiration and affection and all the stuff that goes along with that. I have love with you, the noun. And it might sound all mushy. Oh, here we are back to love again. But anyone who loves the verb that is, and ask the question, what does love require of me, knows it's not mushy, or easy, or even clear sometimes. It may mean giving up your favorite sport so that you can be home with your kids. It may mean stepping down from community volunteering to care for the loved one in your home. It may mean not going into the bar for the sake of the friends you're with, or It may mean going into the bar for the friends who are there. Love isn't always clear. Before I I went back to school, Steve and I had our pink and blue jobs. It was perfect, it was beautiful, it worked for us. He didn't know where the laundry room was. I didn't know how to start the lawnmower. Everything worked. But then when I went back to school, he took over the laundry. Now he's the laundry czar. I'm not even allowed near the laundry room but I still don't know how to start the lawn more. I think I won. He always helped out, always, with the vacuuming and the mopping, but but it was amped up once I was studying. Not because he felt like it, not because he loved, but because he loved me. Loved me the verb. Not because it was easy, but because he loved me, the verb. He still loves me, by the way, but I should clarify that. But you see, love isn't a formula. Right? It's not a set of rules. It's recognizing the other's need and how do I meet that need? What can I do to meet that need? And what it means is it's not always clear. Paul said it like this, oh, no one anything except to love another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law, has fulfilled all the rules. Love fulfills the rules. The bottom line is when we're really loving, there's no need for rules. (laughs) Now I know, it makes some of us gasp a little bit. Not sure what to do with a faith without rules. Surely things are going to get out of hand. Everyone's going to be doing whatever they want, whatever their opinion is. They'll be just sinning all over the place. But that's because we might have a very low view of love. Because love is a much higher bar, right, than rules and laws. Mark unpacked all of this in a series a few months ago called What Does Love Require of Me? I love what Professor Norman Wearsby said. He said, sin at its core is the failure of love the failure of love. We don't have to fear sinning if we're striving after love. If you take every sin, every sin, any sin you can think of, and you autopsy it, at its core, it's a failure to love. Wearsbo was kind of summarizing a passage that we hear all the time, a passage that's so familiar to us. We hear it at weddings. Sometimes we're so over-familiar with it, it loses its impact. I think he solidly summarize 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It isn't proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Ouch. It keeps no record of wrongs. Double ouch. Love doesn't delight in evil and the downfall of others, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Love never fails. Period. 
Love the verb never fails. Love is the end game, it's the goal, it's the win. It might mean that our objective isn't met. The reconciliation that we hoped for didn't materialize. The marriage that we wanted to save, the enemy that we wanted to win over didn't happen. But if we acted in love, we won. Love wins. You know what that means? It means we might not always get it right all the time, but when the motivation is love, it won't fail. It's a win every time. The end game is love regardless of the outcome. That's somewhat of a relief, I think. And love is the Jesus way. When Jesus says, I am the way, he's saying, my way is the way, and my way is love. I am the way, I am love. Walk in my way and you will see God. Walk in love and you will see God. I'd love to leave you as we wrap up with three verses just kind of dangling there as we close. Maybe teasers, verses to ponder, consider, sit with. Verses that might challenge our thinking. Maybe we can explore these down the road. It was written to a church in Turkey in the late first century. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Whoever, whoever, whoever lives in love, lives in God and God in them. Whoever claims to love God, but hates his brother or sister, that's his fellow human beings, is a liar. For whoever doesn't love their brother or sister cannot love God. And this is what we're trying to live here at Lakeside, collectively, albeit imperfectly at times, because it's hard, right? It's, love is hard. It's hard to be in a community with those we strongly disagree with, those we think are wrong, those whose opposing views might actually be hurtful to us those who irritate us. Lakeside, you're doing the hard thing. You're doing the love thing. Love is a verb. You're walking the Jesus way. Let's keep walking, shall we? Keep persevering, shall we? Because Jesus promised, if we do, we will see God. We will. Wonder as Noah creates some space here for us, if we could just pause for a moment. Just consider. Are you excited about the idea of Jesus surprising you? Or does it ignite dread or worry? Maybe you don't like surprises. Can you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the source of your dread, what, what, what is it that you fear? Or maybe is there someone at Lakeside, is there someone in your neighborhood, your condo building, your, your school, your work, in your life that you just struggle to love in the verb sense? Not the mushy feeling sense, just the, the verb sense. Love is an action, doing love. Can you ask the Holy Spirit to help you to love that person? How? Can you love that person in the midst of their need? Let's just pause for a moment. Jesus, we, uh, we long 
to walk your way. That's why we're here. That's why we're online. Help us to walk the way of love. Help us to see each other as who you created us to be in the beauty in which you created each one of us. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Give us courage to not fear surprises, but to be excited. What are you gonna show us, Jesus? What is, what is it about yourself that you wanna reveal to us? What, what images of God need correcting? What do we need to unlearn in order to relearn? I just thank you for our community of Lakeside, for your presence among us. Guide us and empower us, we pray. In your mighty name, amen. As promised, uh, Mark's here to give us an update on how they're doing, and so I want to invite Mark now, if he'll come and join us on the platform. Oh, it was on. Hey, friends. It is, it's so good to see you. It's been a long time. Um, if we haven't met, <laughs> my name is Mark, one of the pastors here. Um, and if we haven't met, it's on me. I've been away. Um, to those of us who know each other, um, it's been strange to be away. Uh, I've missed you all so much. Uh, over the last few months. I asked Robin if I could just have a few minutes to share an update uh, on how things are going on our family and uh, kind of give some context to disappearing in June, kind of. Um, having had the last few months to rest and heal, it's given me time to process and find some insight and some answers and figure out a little bit more about what's been going on figure out how we got here, where we go from here. A lot of that I didn't have in June. Um, in June, all I knew was that I wasn't doing well and I wasn't okay. As someone who burnt out seven years earlier, I was able to see the warning signs and we were able to get a little bit ahead of it, but um, yeah, it was far too similar to where I had been seven years earlier. If you've been around Lakeside for any length of time, that story won't be new to you. Um, for years at our newcomers events, I've told the story of my burnout as a young pastor and used it as an example that we would tell at every newcomer event. We used it as an example to clarify that if you ever aren't doing well or need a break, just tell us. You don't have to push through, explain, or finish up what you started or even find a replacement. Just listen to your body and take a break when you need to and we wanted to make space for healing. We never wanted to sacrifice family for the sake of ministry. So I guess it was kind of timely uh, that the last sermon that I preached in June was about Abraham and Isaac and not sacrificing your family on the altar of ministry. So when I sat down with Robin and Kevin and uh, Jim and Dave from the board uh, and shared with them that I wasn't doing well, they didn't flinch. Uh, they could see that I wasn't doing okay. I don't know if it was the stuttering or shaking or uncontrollable crying, but they seemed to pick up on the sense that I wasn't okay. Um, and they immediately freed me up from my responsibilities and made room for me to heal. Um, they were true to their words and their ethos. They truly, truly made me feel like it was okay to not be okay. And following the Sunday where I announced it to you um, that I was taking time away, the cards and messages you've sent as a church have made it so clear that you really did care about us and our well-being and uh, more than anything we had to offer, the only thing you wanted for Trifina and I and the kids was healing and wholeness. So I first just want to say thank you. 
Um, thank you for your generous words and encouragement notes and even your Swishelli gift cards. Um, I'm pretty sure our server, Ben, is convinced we will never pay for a meal with anything other than gift cards. Uh, there was even that one time when we got put in the booth behind Dick and Ellie Baumgartner and they just loved us with hugs and then secretly paid our bill. And to be honest, I think we earned that one because those are the rowdiest 80-year-olds I've ever met. So having to endure their presence for that meal, they paid up. Um, but honestly, friends, a lot of organizations talk about caring about people. It's often just talk. But you as a church community, you embodied it for us and... We're forever grateful. The last two months have created a lot of space to reflect and heal and fold laundry. So Steve, I'm with you. For the first time in our life, we're actually caught up in that department. Um, but seriously though, in, in that time, we had a lot of space to process how we ended up here. And honestly, it's tough to summarize in a few minutes, but I'll try, and as always, I'll probably teeter on the edge of oversharing, but that's what I do with our Lakeside family, and uh, anything else would not feel appropriate for the community that we are and all that we've been through together. So to start, I mean, you know. You know intimately that the last few years have not been easy. We've been navigating a child who suffered a severe autistic burnout. I shared that story with you last summer as a church. I shared what it was like in our home when one of your children's nervous system is trapped in fight or flight. It'd been the hardest year of our lives, and if that wasn't enough, it also just perfectly timed, uh, paralleled with the hardest season of ministry that I've ever led through. Uh, work that I'm glad we did, and yet it was hard nonetheless. Through that process, in order to support our child, the doctor encouraged us to prepare to live a much slower life. It was hard to imagine a slower life. We rarely went out as it was. We canceled on people regularly, and we could rarely have people over. But we continued to slow down, continued to remove demands from our life. And you as a church were amazing in all of this. The board was gracious enough to move board meetings to once a month, to take, make room for me to be home more in the evenings. And I ran out of more than one staff meeting to help in emergencies when they arose. As spring came this year, it was clear everyone in our home was not doing well. And as we were asking, what does love require of me as a church? Trifina and I were asking it in our own personal lives. And we realized love required us to slow down again. And we made some major changes to our life in the spring, changes we never thought we'd make. And for me, in this slowing down, there was space for me to see that the combination of the last few years of our home life and work life uh, had caught up with me. Uh, and my nervous system was fried. I was so busy trying to keep my head above the water, I didn't realize just how not okay I was until we slowed down. Quick caveat on that. When I say the last few years of my work and personal life caught up with me, I'm not saying in any way that work was too much or the church expected too much or that the church wore me out. Numerous times, the church board and staff have asked me, what could we have done differently? The answer has continuously been nothing. This is not a story of a church overworking and underappreciating their pastor. That story is way too common, but it's not mine. Lakeside has been so gracious and caring for Trifina and I through the hardest season of our life. They have sought to care for and support us over and over again. Even congregants who met with me who made the mistake of casually asking, how are you doing, Mark? And ended up pastoring me instead over that coffee. Sitting and crying with me showed us just how supportive this community was. I have the dream pastoral job, leading the dream pastoral team, reporting to the dream church board, and serving the most wonderful congregation. This is not a story of a pastor getting ripped apart by his abusive church. This is a story of a pastor whose demands at work mixed with his demands at home, became too much for the way his brain is wired. In this time, I've been processing so many, processing so many layers of life and work and ministry and future. And there's so many pieces to this. I tell our staff all the time, ministry is the only job in the world that I'm aware of where your professional life and then your spiritual life 
and your family life all get mixed together in a way that most professions don't. So as I look back on 15 years of ministry, at all the different roles that I've occupied as youth pastor and church planter, teaching pastor, and now lead pastor, I spent a lot of time processing the amount of mental, emotional, and relational capacity that full-time ministry requires of me, regardless of role. And it helped me realize that in this season, in the way that my brain is wired and with our unique home life, I realized that full-time ministry doesn't leave room for me to be the loving husband or father or man that I want to be. And bottom line, I realized if I applied the question I've preached for years, the question, what does love require of me? If I apply it to myself, the answer I've consistently come to over the last few months has been to has been to step down as the lead pastor of Lakeside Church um, and to take my position as a lay person and as a congregant of Lakeside Church, but no longer a staff member. So this week I sent my official resignation to the letter to the elders of Lakeside and sat down with the staff on Friday and I asked to switch seats. Um, to no longer be a full-time member, staff member, and instead be a congregant, part of this beautiful, beautiful body, alongside all of you. Because this is my church, this is my community, I love you all so much. Um, it's been such a great privilege to serve as your pastor, to serve this church and staff and board. And while we're deeply deeply grieving, closing the chapter as your pastor. Try and I do look forward to being congregants with you. Thanks for letting me share today. Lakeside family, um, as, we, as we together just bid farewell to Mark and his role as lead pastor, we just want to express our heartfelt gratitude for his leadership, guidance, and dedication to the community. While we're saddened to see him leave his role, we're filled with so much hope for the future. Um, he has helped shape here for us at Lakeside. And we and myself are just so, so, so excited that he's uh, going to still be calling Lakeside Church his home. Uh, Mark has truly left things in a strong and very positive place, and his impact is going to be felt for many years to come. And as we move forward, we trust that God will continue to guide us, and we're excited about the new opportunities that lie ahead. And together as a family, we've, we've got this together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is hard news. <laughs> This is hard news. And I won't even try to sum up what, what they've meant to us personally, but also how Mark has led Lakeside over the past six years, over obstacles and into new frontiers of faith and following, leading us, modeling for us the Jesus way. You continue to model the Jesus way. And we'll be grieving for some time. And grieving is good, and it's healthy, and we need to do it, and we need to give ourselves space to do that. So next Sunday, uh, September the 1st, we are going to have a service of gratitude and blessing and worship and lament. Gratitude for where we've come, and as Dave has said, the strong and solid trajectory on which Mark has set us. Gratitude for a new chapter that God is about to write for them as a family, and we get to be alongside them, 
cheer them on. And we can celebrate with them as their friends and even grieve our own loss. The two can hold side by side, can stand side by side, and we get to bless them in this new chapter that they're moving into. And so we invite you to send any anecdotes, stories, even funny stories, and memories of the impact that Mark and Trifina have had on your life, personally or as a church. And you can send those to lakesidechurch.ca slash memories. And we're going to gather these and we're going to share them next Sunday. And we're going to give space for Mark and Trifina to share their reflections of their time here in ministry. So please, if you can, send these in the next couple of days so that we have a chance to curate and organize them and to present them next week. And, so, and then following the gathering next week, we're going to have a potluck charcuterie all the way down the atrium. A uh, big charcuterie board. And so I invite you to bring anything that you would put on your charcuterie board. Uh, cheese, already sliced, please, fruit, already washed, cold meats, crackers, as ready as it could be just to put on the table so it doesn't involve a lot of volunteers. Nothing that we need a knife and fork for, uh, no crock pots, just charcuterie, and please, no nuts or seafood, uh, and there'll be a sep separate gluten-free table. An esteemed friend of ours <laughs> recently said, God is always making things new and making new things. And so let's hold to that hope as we move into the new thing that God is inviting us into. And immediately following this gathering, there's a letter that will go out to the partners, uh, those who aren't here. And if you're a partner, you'll receive that letter this afternoon. I just wonder if I can invite you to stand as I bless us as we go. chose this blessing from Paul, this benediction, specifically for this moment. Now to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to Christ's power that is at work within us, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Bless you, friends.